So, but I, I'm going to talk about secrecy a little bit. And uh, it's a complicated subject, uh, but I should tell you, in the interest of full disclosure, that I believe in the need for secrecy. Um, I am not, as I said, a radical in the sense that there are things that as a journalist or as a citizen, I wouldn't disclose. I would not disclose true movements in advance. I would not disclose uh, blueprints for nuclear weapons. I would not intentionally out a U.S. covert operative overseas and expose that person um, to a risk of death. Secrecy is not about something that's known that no one else knows about. Secrecy is about the control and constraint and restraint of information. It's about channeling, funneling, and controlling information. But it's not about one person walking around with the knowledge and no one else. There's another thing that is, is often said about secrecy, and that is, what you don't know can't hurt you. Now, I don't know what your life experience has been, but that doesn't square with mine. Um, sometimes what I haven't known has come back to bite me hard. And, um, and especially in a democracy, what you don't know can not only hurt you, it can literally undo the republic. I mean, the whole notion of a democracy is predicated upon the idea that we have information. If you cast a vote and you don't know what the person stands for, it's a crapshoot. A democracy is based upon the idea of having access to information. It's rude to whisper, it's rude to eavesdrop. And there's a kind of implicit contradiction there. The one bars as rude the transmission of information that is privileged in a public setting, and the other chastises the person who tries to intercept that, that message. And that kind of conflict is a part of government as well. How to balance the need to be inclusive and share information on the one hand, and at the other hand, the right to transmit privileged information. I want to give you an example. There's a, a woman named Judith Paglia. When she was seven weeks old, and this was in 1948, October 6th, so let's see, what's the date today? This is the second. So this would have been uh, uh, four days from now, in 1948, she was seven weeks old, and her dad was an engineer on an airplane, uh, a B-29, and it was flying over Georgia, and there were some other civilian engineers on it, and this plane um, crashed, and everyone on board was killed. Now, Judith Pauly had no idea what was going on being seven weeks old, but her mother and the other widows got together and sued the government under tort law to find out what had happened and to recover because they lost their husbands, they lost a source of family income, they sued. The U.S. government took the position that the case could not go forward. Why? Because if it did, information would come out that would material, materially harm the national security of the United States. The plane was engaged in something secretive, and therefore the case could not be full. Um, that was fine. And Judith Paul had grew up to be a woman, and then a few years ago, she was surfing online, and she stumbled across a reference to this case. It's a USB Reynolds is the name of the case. And she discovered <coughs> that a report about this flight, the report that her mother and the other widows had saw it, had been declassified. And it was now available. And she got a copy of it. And she read it. And she was horrified. She was horrified for two reasons. One, because there was nothing secret in the report and nothing secret about the flight. And two, the report contained a very damning summary of the lack of maintenance of that airplane, which led, in all likelihood, to its crash and the loss of her father. So she believed that the government had essentially, through fraud, prevailed in that case, and she brought her own case, years and years and years later, decades later, as a grown woman. The federal government, the Solicitor General representing the U.S. government, struck an extraordinary argument to defend itself against the second case. 
The U.S. government argued that, yes, it's true, there was nothing secretive about that flight, but there could have been. <laughs> now, your reaction was my reaction. It didn't pass the straight face test. But it did win, and the case was tossed. And U.S. v. Reynolds remains the benchmark case, the case, in secrecy in this country. That's very problematic. It means that when people bring an action, it can't move forward. It doesn't get to the level of judging the merits of the case. It's tossed right when it comes in because it threatens to expose something harmful. To quote Potter Stewart, the justice, um, in the opinion of, on the Pentagon Papers, when everything's a secret, nothing's a secret. When everything is classified, you forget what should be. You become desensitized. And we are right now, at this point in our history, facing a tsunami of secrecy. It is, it is almost impossible for me to convey to you the volume and the mass of secrecy. If you take the number of times that the stamp of secrecy comes down in a given year by the federal government, it would break down every hour, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, it would break down to 1,600 times an hour. Now, you've got to ask yourself, are we in possession of 1,600 good secrets every hour? And the answer is no. We don't know where Saddam is saying. Well, we know where Saddam is saying is. We don't know where, where Bin Laden is. We don't know where he's going to strike next. There are a ton of things we don't know, and it's not embedded in those 1,600 secrets per hour. What is the best way to disable those who want to meddle in policy? What is the best way to obtain a superior position? Answer: To deprive them, to starve them of information. If Congress doesn't have access to information, it's in no position to challenge the executive. If the public doesn't have access to information, it's in no position to challenge. And so the executive, the unitary executive, benefits directly from the expansive secrecy. Expansive secrecy fuels expansive executive power. Uh, and that is this, that uh, given how Government, so often, uh, is a creature of expedience, thinks about re-election, thinks about winning and victory. It responds to what it hears from the public. If it hears nothing, it interprets it as carte blanche. But if it hears something, it does respond. If the public spoke out on these issues, when the public speaks out on these issues, when they get concerned, the government will be responsive.